Welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm Kathleen Walter. Joining us is Robert Riley, author of the brand new book, The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. Mr. Riley is a senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council and has written for a number of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the National Review. Mr. Riley is a former director of The Voice of America and has taught at the National Defense University. He's also served in the White House and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Welcome to Newsmax TV, Mr. Riley. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. Congratulations on the book. You attribute the violence coming out of the Middle East, including the terror attacks against the U.S., to what you identify as the closing of the Muslim mind and Islam's intellectual suicide. Explain, if you will, Islam's intellectual suicide, and how does it explain Islam's hostility toward the West? Well, I would tell you that... Um, as Benedict XVI said in his Regensburg address, uh, acting unreasonably is against God. Uh, therefore, using violence to promote religion would be against God. However, what if uh, God is without reason or above reason? Then there is no barrier between that theology and mandatory violence. And what happened within Islam in the ninth century, there was a deadly debate over the nature of God. One side, the Mutazilites said, God is rationality and justice. The other side, the Asherites said, no, he's not. He's pure will and power. Unfortunately, the Asherite side prevailed and a theology developed of pure will and power that left no barriers of rationality against arbitrary exercise of will uh, for any purpose. And at the end of that trail, we end up with that notorious statement by Abdullah Azam, who was one of Osama bin Laden's spiritual mentors. And Osama mentioned this in his post 9-11 tape. He quoted Azam saying, terrorism is an obligation in Allah's religion. So that's what you get from a theology of pure will and power to terrorism being a religious obligation. So what are the consequences for Muslim societies themselves of this? Well, the consequences are, are many. Uh, this, this deformed theology produced a dysfunctional culture. Part of the theology involved the denial of cause and effect in the natural world, which is an astonishing thing to say, but it's very explicit in, in the theology of Al-Ghazali and Al-Ashari. Fire doesn't burn cotton. It is God directly who ignites the cotton. The fire has nothing to do with it. Decapitation doesn't cause death. A decapitated person may live. It's God who withdraws life. So there are no intermediary causes and effects in the natural world. God does everything. This creates enormous problems, obviously, for understanding the world because it simply becomes a series of miracles. Uh, the world becomes ununderstandable in this respect. And it obviously undermines the, the prospect for science, which is the search for the laws of nature. Uh, in addition to which, the, man's free will is imperiled if God does everything directly. And it is no mistake that constitutional democratic political order did not develop indigenously anywhere in the Muslim world for this reason. Mr. Riley, are there any movements underway that could lead to a so-called Muslim enlightenment down the road? Well, you know, there were many such movements beginning in the last half of the 19th century, and particularly early in the 20th century. Uh, Ahmed Khan in India, uh, Mohammed Abda in Egypt, and others. Unfortunately, they weren't successful. And in the last part of the 20th century, through this early decade in the 21st, the intellectual impetus is on the other side. It is becoming more radicalized, and um, the explanation offered by these radical Islamists is the one that is spreading. It's much harder to go into the kind of introspection within Islam that's needed to say, well, wait a minute, we, we lost reason some centuries ago, and we need to restore its status so we can think our ways out of this mess in which we live. That's hard to do. It's much easier to accept the message from bin Laden and the Muslim Brotherhood that the reason why we lost our past glories is that we have left the path of God. 
The way to regain this glory is to return to the path of God. How do we do that? By attacking the apostate regimes in our own countries and by attacking the West as well. Now, one of the ways the United States has responded to Islam's threat is with wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, with General Petraeus, now commander of American and NATO forces, fighting the Taliban. But the problem, you would argue, is much bigger than the Taliban alone. What do you think that the West must do, in your opinion, to confront the Islamist crisis head on? Well, I think, first of all, we have to understand that what we're facing is primarily a theological problem, and that therefore economic programs or sociological or political programs are not going to solve this situation until it's addressed at the theological level. Now, Muslims aren't really interested in hearing from non-Muslims uh, about this because we don't share their religion. But there are uh, Muslim intellectual reformers who need help and assistance from us. Uh, and w w one of the real puzzles over the past eight to ten years is that health, help has not been forthcoming. Uh, we, we're not providing them with security or printing presses or broadcast facilities so their message can have some resonance within the Muslim world. Instead, this highly disciplined, highly fanatical, trained and well-funded radical Islamist group is well-funded and is making a substantial progress throughout the Muslim world. Now, speaking of well-funded groups, we've just learned that Mexico has foiled an attempt by Hezbollah to establish a South American network. We read about homegrown terrorists here in the U.S. To what extent has this struggle come to the West? Well, the, the struggle has come to the West to the extent to which <clears throat> the West itself has lost faith and the extent to which uh, it, it, there, are, there has been massive Muslim immigration, particularly in Europe. Um, the thing that most appalls Muslims is the loss of the sense of the sacred. And most particularly in Western Europe, uh, that sense of the sacred is gone. As you probably know, there are more Muslims in mosques on Friday in Great Britain than there are Church of England people in their pews on Sunday. Um, unbelief is the antagonist for Muslims. And we in the West have accomplished this extraordinary conflation in Muslim minds between democracy and unbelief. They see democracy as a form of unbelief because of the way in which we have promoted it as an anything goes, uh, aimless freedom without any sort of moral moorings. Okay, President Obama has embraced the Muslim world and in fact apologized to it. Do you see his approach of engagement working? No, I would say that the Muslim world detects an apology a sign of weakness and that that was not a very wise thing to do. And in his Cairo speech uh, just over a year ago, he had the most curious rhetorical strategy, which was instead of confronting the, the, the world of, of um, unreality, in which Arabs live, he participated in it, celebrated it, embraced it, and thinking by entering it from the inside, he could change a couple of words and there, therefore influence the behavior of the Arab world. That's the only rhetorical strategy that could make sense of his speech, but I don't think that approach is, is working. And in fact, his own decline uh, in the opinion polls in the Middle East uh, more or less indicate that. Mr. Riley, a big story this week is President Obama's hosting of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the White House for the first time since he humiliated Netanyahu with that flap over settlements back in March. Critics say Americans are impatient for real progress with Israel before its temporary freeze on West Bank settlements expires in September. And Israel did show some responsiveness when the U.S. demanded it ease the Gaza blockade. What must President Obama do to make progress diplomatically with Israel and Netanyahu? Well, I think the, the huge mistake on President Obama's part was to distance himself so considerably from Israel as an ally of the United States. I know that was well-intentioned on his part because by doing so, he wanted to be accepted by the Arab and Muslim world as the fair broker. But how this was interpreted in the Muslim world, this distancing of the United States from Israel, was an opportunity for them to become more aggressive and more provocative in their attempts to delegitimize morally Israel. And the Turkish attempt to break the blockade was the most obvious and egregious example of that. 
And uh, even with that action, the United States did not come to the defense of Israel. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, we are creating the opportunities for Israel's enemies to become more aggressive, and that's a, that's a big mistake. Now, should Obama and Netanyahu make progress, do you think that that will move Israelis and Palestinians closer to a peace deal? Or, given what you describe as the closing of the Muslim mind, is peace even possible in the Middle East? I would say that anyone who wants to follow the so-called peace process needs to read the fifth surah in the Quran, in which Allah says that Israel broke the covenant by changing his words, that is, changing Allah's words, the most grievous offense that uh, anyone could commit, and they lost their right to the Holy Land by doing that, according to the Quran. To see Jews back in Israel as the sovereign power and ruling over Muslims is simply, at that level of revelation, unacceptable. And until there's another interpretation of the fifth surah in the Muslim world that can allow for a legitimate uh, Israeli state and accept its existence, I, I, my, my, I regret to have to answer that no. Some are saying that progress with Israel, though, could help the U.S. firm up international support for sanctions against Iran's nuclear program, which um, were recently approved by the U.N. Security Council. How do you assess President Obama's response to Iran's nuclear threat? Well, one has to, has to uh, be glad that at least uh, something was done with these U.N. sanctions. But I think it's universally recognized that it's not going to be enough to stop Iran from uh, developing nuclear weapons. And we will then have the equivalent of a Muslim North Korea on the Persian Gulf. It's going to be extraordinarily dangerous. And I don't see anything the United States uh, is doing that can prevent it. And I, that's a bipartisan failure. It certainly goes back to President Bush every much as it is uh, President Obama's failure. All right. The book is called The Closing of the Muslim Mind. Robert Riley, congratulations on the book and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure talking with you. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.